Hello everybody, this is Mikey K for Scratch and welcome to an introduction to Spine. Now if you've been following the channel for a little bit, you may have noticed I just actually covered Spine uh, a few weeks back in the Game Developer Toolbox, uh, which is a look at the essential tools for game developers, and here you can see it in front of you. So that was uh, April the 6th I covered that, and when I covered that I said, uh, don't worry about too much detail because I'm actually going to do a follow-up post where I'm going to go into some more detail on using Spine. Well, welcome to that day. Uh, coincidentally, there's also a text-based version of this on Game From Scratch if you want to see or a quicker reference or whatever to what we're covering here and all the code we're about to do. It's available on Game From Scratch. I will link that down below. Uh, today, we're specifically going to be jumping in and taking a look at Spine. Now, what is Spine? Spine is essentially a 2D animation kit um, for games. Or I suppose you could use it for any applications, but basically it's designed and geared towards games. Uh, now, a cool fact is it was actually created and written over top of LiveGDX by one of the creators, or the original founders of the LiveGDX project. Um, it doesn't, of course, only run on LiveGDX. It works very well with it, obviously, but it works on many, many platforms, as we will see in a second. Now, Spine itself is created by a company called Esoteric Software. Uh, this is not free software. Uh, it's commercial. There is a free trial available. Uh, and the trial version can do everything I'm about to show you except save. Uh, so you're not going to be able to export your data out or run it in code by following along uh, with the trial. On top of that, then, it leaves us the three commercial packages. There's Essential, there's Professional, and Enterprise. Now, Enterprise is all geared towards revenue. So if you make over half a million dollars a year, you have to buy Enterprise. Uh, for everybody else, there's Essential and Professional. Essential should be good for most of you. Every single thing you're about to see today can be done in Essential. Now, Professional adds a few features on top of that. Things like uh, meshes, freeform deformation, weighted meshes, uh, IK constraints, uh, transform constraints. The majority of there is when you're starting to get into really complicated skeletons, or you want to have multiple bones influencing the same shape, or you want to do complex shapes like such as uh, um, a cape fluttering in the wind, for example, that would probably be best done with a freeform deformation. So those are the kind of things that the Pro uh, license brings to you. But for the most part, and again, for everything we are going to see here today, this essential license works for you. Now, once you've gone ahead and created your animations, which we'll all see just a moment from now, um, you can then go ahead and use them in your game engine of choice. Now, what game engine is that? Well then, uh, out of the box, supported by Esoteric Software on GitHub, there are runtimes available for Cocos 2DX, Corona, Flash, LibGDX, Love, Monogame, SFML, Starling, 3JS, Torque 2D, Turbulence, Unity, Unity 2D Toolkit, XNA, as well as generic implementations in ActionScript, C, C++, Objective-C, C Sharp, JavaScript, and Lua. So you may probably just covered off just about every programming language under the sun. Now, using the generic runtimes, you probably still have to wire it up to your game engine of choice. So, for example, if you want wanted to get it working in Unreal Engine, you would end up doing using the C++ runtime and then binding it to you know, um, the Unreal specific code if there isn't already a runtime available. Speaking of that, there are a number of uh, third-party runtimes not created by Esoteric that are available uh, for, again, another model game, Unity, Wave Engine, uh, Marmalade. Uh, there's one for Dart, Go, Hacks, JavaScript, Lua, the default engine that just came out, Moi. Um, you name it. So there's probably a runtime available for you. Now, what a runtime enables you to do is basically take the output that were generated today, these nice animations we're creating today, and just drop them in your game and use them. And it's pretty powerful stuff. And on top of that, and this is not something we're going to cover today, uh, but there's also functionality in there for things like uh, animation mixing and blending. So you can move from one animation to another, etc. So it does basically give you a drop-in 2D animation system for your engine of choice, which then works with their tool that we're about to see right now. Now, so this here is Spine. This is the main interface. It's a very straightforward, very clean um, application by far. Now, we're going to come back to it in a little bit. I'm actually going to go through creating a very, very simple rig. Now, I'm getting that terminology from the 3D world, and 3D animation is very well defined. Basically, what you do is you create a mesh or your polygons that define what your shape is. And then underlying that mesh, you create something called an armature, which is another word, fancy word for basically saying a skeleton. And the skeleton is composed of bones, and those bones have an influence or weight of on the... Um, 
the mesh that's above it. Well, it works kind of similar in Spine in 2D, except for obviously there's no, um, you know, there's no 3D model we can manipulate. We have to work with 2D images here. So how does this work? Well, we actually split a 2D graphic up into different pieces and then put it all back together again. So instead of the way traditional 2D animation works, is you basically draw a frame and then modify it slightly for the next frame of animation, and then again and again and again and again and again. So if say you have 30 frames of animation in your run cycle, that's 30 different images you had to draw. Draw. Now granted, you can use cloning and, and copy-paste kind of thing to, to narrow down that workload, but it's still a cubic ton of work. Uh, and this kind of a solution takes away a lot of that. Now let's look at one of the demos that actually is. It's available for purchase from Esoteric. Um, I'm just going to use it. It's a more complete example than we're going to create, but you can see like a full-blown project on the go. Now navigating around the interface is dog simple. To pan around, just uh, right mouse button, and go. Uh, middle mouse button zooms in and out. If you'd like to have multiple views, you can, uh, let's see, it's, oh, sorry, we can minimize the view out here. Uh, we've got some things here that are collapsed down, so we can also bring up uh, the weights, the outline, the metrics, slot color. So all these different windows are available to us, uh, but we don't actually need, don't really need any of them. So that is your interface. Very straightforward, very simple. You can zoom in and out using the um, scroll wheel or control and the right mouse button. And then obviously, oops, I just screwed something up big time. All right. Well, I just messed up my armature. So here, let me just reload that quickly. <sighs> okay. So here we are back to normal. And then otherwise you've got your, your manipulators and your controls. But what you're doing here is you're defining your um, art assets and you're binding the underlying bones. So you'll see as I mouse over here, see that, that is a bone. So this is an image and this is a bone. So what you would do is you draw your shape in two dimensions and then cut it up into different pieces. Now where this gets important is let's look at something like this, um, this jet pack right here. See that jet pack is in behind him? Well, that's really important. That's the drawing order that is determining how things are gonna be drawn. So if I here now press um, shift in the plus key, I'm moving it forward in the draw order. So you can now you see it's in front and then minus it's in the back. You'll have to do this with all your things. So here, even though it's not visible and with a normal 2D drawing, you obviously wouldn't draw what isn't there. But when you're working in spine with 2D, you're going to want to draw things layered. So this back arm here, this piece right here, you would have to draw that accordingly. Uh, but it still greatly reduces your art load. So you, you create your, your art as a bunch of cut-up pieces, you apply a skeleton to them, and then once you're done, once you've got everything set up and looking exactly how you want it, just so click over here, and now you're in animate mode. Now animate is where, um, well, you animate things. So it's this, what you see down here is called a dope sheet. It's like a timeline showing keyframes. Uh, a keyframe is uh, a spot in time where uh, some key values, namely uh, rotate, translate, and scale values are, you can see the little keys over here, they're stored. Or basically we say, at this point in time, translate to this point, rotate by this amount, and scale by this amount, and then move forward in the timeline and do it again, move it forward. So let me just actually bring it animation up here. Now over here you can see the hierarchy view of your entire scene. Uh, at the top here you've got your armature or your skeleton. So your very root level is this guy, the whole gunman as a whole. And then there's the root node of it, like so. And then the root is made up of different bones, which in turn have children, which in turn have children. So here you can see uh, we've got, for example, the hip. And out of the hip we've got, oh yeah, recoil doesn't make a lot of sense, the back thigh, the body, and then the front thigh. So you kind of create this hierarchy of bones, and then you attach images to bones. We're going to do all that in a moment, so I'm not going to get into too, too much detail. But you see here also we have the list of drawing orders. This is what we just talked about with the shift plus and minus for moving the drawing order front and back. And you can also uh, keyframe these things over time. Uh, here are the images that went together to make up our scene. So you see, like, for example, so I could actually drag one. I normally can drag one. Oh, I'm in animate mode. So if I was in pose mode, I could drag and drop one of these into the scene to work with it. Again, we'll get back to that in a moment. But here we go. Here are some of our animations. Here's the run animation. Just click over here, and you can see. So there we've got a number of keyframes for different things set over time. So go ahead and run that, and there is a simple run animation. Well, you'll see here also it's going sound, 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 sound. Well, that's firing off events. So you see it's firing an event halfway through and then at the end. 
So those would be where you do a sound for each footprint or footstep. We can then tie those back into our game code. We'll get to that in a second. We're actually going to be doing that with our example. So now let's go and create something from scratch. We're going to create a very, 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 very simple project. Uh, so I'm going to discard the changes. Now what you see here, the default um, view. This is your axis of orientation. So here is zero and zero. Um, we're going to be working with LibGDX today, so it likes things. This is the bottom left corner. So we're going to arrange things up this way. So here's our skeleton, and we've got a root by default. And so I'm going to just move that in and up about there. Now, next up, we're going to need some images to go ahead and draw with just temporarily so we can see where they are. And I'm just going to use some of the examples. These examples all come with it. Uh, so I'm just going to use your spine boy example. And we're just going to do a leg kicking. A very, very trivial example here. So I need a front thigh and front shin. So basically here we've got an upper and a lower leg. If you want to select multiple things at a time, by the way, control and click like so. Or you can click individually over here. So now what I want to do is move this guy. So it's kind of about there. So just grab him. And you see your different uh, movement modes are over here. And you've got the traditional manipulators. This way. Now, I wish there was an easy way to see where the root is. All right. So there, that, that root should be about right. Yeah. Okay. And then this guy is going to ultimately be down there. And now we're going to be using these again, but I just want to get the sizing in for proportions. So now what we need to do is go ahead and create a skeleton to go with this. So we've got our root up here, and we're just going to start off of it. And we're going to create a bone out and another bone out for our legs. So create, just come down here to the bone tool and just go click it there and drag. So you see in the hierarchy over on the right, it says bone and we'll go right about to the kneecap and then we'll click and drag and create a second bone like so. And right click, I'm done. So control highlight, you'll see what I've done. So I just created these two bones that are going to go in here accordingly. Now that we know we got our proportions right. I'm just going to go ahead. There's probably a better way of doing this, but this is the way that I found. I'm just, I've used these up. Uh, let's just delete them both. Okay. So now we've got our two bones and I'm just going to come down here and instead grab those two guys again. So front thigh graphic. And we are going to, oh, actually, let's do one thing first. We'll call that guy upper leg and lower leg. Now you'll see this guy is under this. So the upper leg owns the lower leg and in turn the root owns all of it. So if we move the root, all the parent and children relationships go. And that's actually what these are here. This is going to control how this manipulator is. So this is done locally, switch to parent. So now it's done relative to its parent or the world, which is now freeform for the entire thing. So that's what these different settings are down here for the axes to use for translation. And you see here, we can switch between rotation, translation, and scaling for moving things around. So now we've got our bones in place. Once again, here, let me just hide and show them. I'm going to take our uh, thigh graphic, so front thigh, and we're going to drop that on upper leg. And it's going to say, add this image to this slot. And we're going to say, yep. And very annoyingly, it's going to be positioned very poorly. Now, the chances are, again, this is uh, my issue more than anything, the way that my workflow is wrong. There's probably a better, cleaner way than what I'm doing. So you, with, you've got the image selected, you can move it regardless to the bone underneath. And now we're going to go ahead and add the lower leg as well. So let's just do front shin. And we'll stick that image on the lower bone. I am just the shin active, come down here, like so, and done. So let me just grab, make sure everything looks good. Yeah, so our lower bone is in place. And our, so this bone here is going to influence this image. This bone here is going to implement, is going to in, bleh, whew, affect this guy. So now what I want to do is actually move this guy more towards the ground plane. I can grab this root skeleton instead and just drag that down like so. Okay, so we've just rigged our first semi-character. It's not the greatest thing in the world. It's not very complicated or anything, but you get the idea of how you do it. So you basically, you create your armature or your underlying skeleton, and then you apply the images on top that those skeletons control. And you take your cut-up image and you put it back together this way, sort of like working with Legos on top of your skeleton. And now that we've got that going, let's animate it.
You can start with the animate process. We just click up here, go from setup over to animate, and we are now in animation mode. So uh, this process is very, very, very easy. Actually, if you've ever worked in animation in any way whatsoever, you will have a pretty good idea of what's going on here. What you're doing is creating something called keyframe animations. And what you're telling the computer is at this position or this position or this position for this given bone, take a keyframe either for the rotation, translation, or scale. So I can set it into a position, keyframe it. Set it to another position, keyframe it. And then what happens is the computer will interpolate or figure out the blend between the two points and, and fill in the blanks for you. So instead of creating 30 different uh, frames of, uh, of poses for your bones, you only create them the keyframes, and then the computer will do the rest of the work for you. Uh, so you see up here, we've got um, in our hierarchy of our guy here, we got this animation section here. So just come on here. If there is not one already, go ahead and just create a new animation, and we'll call this kick. And now with kick, we're going to go ahead and start posing it. Now, if you hear a dog in the background, I apologize. Uh, there's a very angry squirrel going around. Uh, so anyways, we are back here. So now what we do is just pose it. Now, we can do one of two things. We can take and set the rotation, translation, and scale. We're just going to be using rotation in this particular case. But we can either come in here and manually press the key for each one we want to set, or we can have an auto key, and then we just need to make the update, and it will automatically create keys for everything we change. We're just going to go ahead and use auto keying for that. So this is your timeline in the dope sheet. We're just going to go ahead and set it to, say, the 10th frame of animation. And we're just going to rotate there, and then go down to the next bone here, and rotate it back slightly. We're going to go forward to 20 frames. So we're going to create a 40 frame animation here. So there and then there. So you're seeing it's creating these green dots. Well, those are for each of our rotations as we're doing it. Um, so that is created one for the upper and the lower leg as we've done each rotation over time. So now with 30 frames, we're going to grab this top guy and we're going to rotate it back. Like so, and then the lower bone rotates out. Like so, and then let's finish our animation off here. Again, this is a really crap animation, but you get the idea. You would obviously spend more time on your own. And lower bone. Rotate slightly. So now you can go ahead down here and play, and you'll see there is our kick. Not the greatest kick in the world, but a kick nonetheless. So that is creating an animation. Now you can you could grab all these guys. Um, if you really wish. So we've got here, so we're starting at frame zero, so I could instead scale these out like so, uh, but I won't. Or you can highlight on and we can move that particular frame to stretch this out. So we could grab that one and move it over and change the time. So we're gonna make this one a little bit longer. And you can see it's moving as we go. So that has warped and changed the different speeds of our animation. Made our animation really awful, mind you. Uh, but you can drag and move around these particular keys as you go. We could also take any particular key we want to, and select it, and just go ahead and delete that. So then it leaves this key to this key, and then the computer will interpolate in between, like so. Now you're seeing it automatically loop back to the end, which makes it look a little awkward. So poof, there. That is your animation. Nothing special, nothing really, really difficult here, but that is essentially how animation works. Now, make it look good. <laughs> That's a different story altogether. We are just creating a very, very simple animation here. And then we'll do another one here, just um, an empty one. So, okay, uh, we'll go back to... There. Oh shit, I was, oops, sorry. Uh, I was actually in auto key mode, so I just added that to our animation. I don't want to do that. Okay, let me just head on back, auto key off. Back to frame zero, animations, create a new one. And we'll call this idle, and it'll actually just be that. Okay, so we now have two animations, one called idle and one called kick. We'll switch back to kick, and we'll give it a quick play. You can see what it does, and there. And again, it's just a matter of you set these keyframes as you go across time. Now, another thing that we can do here, though, is we can fire off an event that is picked up by our code. And let's look at that process now. Just here in events, uh, let's go to the midpoint here. And we'll fire an event. And we'll create a new one. And we'll call this half. And half. And we'll give it a string value of halfway. So I think that's what I wanted. And now you'll see at the halfway point, and you'll see it even when you go ahead and play this. So when we get to the, 
let's go looping back on. Get to the midpoint, we should see. Hey, why are you not showing me halfway firing? Ah, I thought it would show me the text. Let's stop that, you. All right, let's go back to our event. Huh. Well, anyways, that will now fire in our code. And that is essentially it. That is how you create your character, how you set up its armature, and then how you go ahead and animate it. Very, very basics here. There's obviously a lot more going on, a lot more capable, and a lot more power that I'm not showing you, but uh, you know, I only have a certain amount of time available, and I'm no expert by any means here. But now once you're done with it, we can go ahead and export our animation out. And there's a few options here. If you really want, you can actually just render it out as a video. Uh, so you could create a video of the animation you just did, 30 frames per second playback if you want, um, draw the bones or not, and you could just create uh, video files. You could also go ahead and create uh, image. Uh, so you could create um, basically 15. So if you did 15 frames per second and it's uh, 40 frames, it would create you know a few hundred images going on there. We could go ahead and create an atlas and have it create them into a sprite sheet if you per not preferred. And there you can see the various different settings that you can set for the sprite sheet. Some very powerful stuff here. So you could create you know. Um, a traditional sprite sheet here with nothing special going on. But what you really want to shine when it comes to spine is to use those run times, to have the power of spine when you're working with stuff. So what we're going to go ahead and do is go ahead and export it as JSON. So you can do it JSON or binary format. We'll go ahead and make it JSON. We're also going to print the atlas out. Now, what we found is I've actually already got some code to do this next step. And this is basically based off of their example. So I'm not going to go through the time of writing this, but I am going to show you integrating. So right here, I'm just going to go ahead and delete the contents out. All right. Don't, don't refractor. How do I turn off smart refractoring? Okay, here, let's just... My IDE is being too smart. So instead, what I'm going to do is kill them this way. Okay, so there we are done. We're going to go ahead, and we now need a file called skeleton. So we need to go ahead and create this asset now from spine. So spine, we're going to go ahead and do our output, and we're going to output it to that particular directory. So that's in my downloads. I call that spine2 core assets. So this is just a standard libgdx project I created using the gdx tool. And then what you do is you download the runtime for the libgdx. I've linked it in the uh, text version of this post. So I'll link that post down below if you need to get access to these files. And you just copy their source code into your folder. I'll show you that in a second. And then you're good to go. So here we're going to go and we're going to bring it to the assets folder right here. Open folder. Da, da, da. Uh, I did not give this guy a name. I think it's going to ask me for it. I'm going to create a texture atlas here. And we're going to go ahead and save that. I shall dub the uh, skeleton. Uh, I'm going to actually save it in the same directory. So your project file and your export generally wouldn't be in the same folder, but it's easier this way. And export. So now it's going ahead, it's spitting out all the files we need. So the JSON file that's going to have our animations in it, uh, the texture file that we're going to go ahead and use. So now we come back here and you see it's created these three files for us. So we got our image is, there's only two of them, so it's a pretty small texture sheet. Our JSON file, which is describing, ooh, what editor is that? Oh, no. Um, so we got our uh, JSON file, which will load in about 20 minutes because Visual Studio is getting extremely bloated these days. And then we have our Atlas. And our Atlas is simply a um, kind of a format that basically tells it where each of those images is within the sprite sheet. And we come over here, let me just bring this guy in from off screen. And there you can see the, uh, the JSON file that is being generated. Very simple, very easily legible, especially if you click the pretty print. Uh, so that is all we need for our code. Now we're gonna go back to our code for a second here. And you see this is uh, the code I wrote uh, again, this is heavily taken from their example, so I'm not going to uh, go into a whole lot of explanation of what's going on here. And if you've never done any LibGDX coding, this is all going to be Greek anyways, but basically you come in, unless of course you're Greek, in which case it's going to be, I don't know, Swahili. Uh, but you see here, we come in, we create a, um, a camera, a sprite batch, a renderer for our skeleton, uh, set it so that it does pre-multiplied alpha so that it draws correctly without outlines. Uh, we load our texture atlas that was just created for us, load our skeleton JSON file, uh, passing in the atlas to use. Uh, we get the skeleton data from the JSON file uh, we just got. 
Uh, we create a skeleton, we position the skeleton, and in this case I'm going to go with 0, 0. Now remember the coordinates are 0, 0 is going to be relative to this bottom left corner, so we're actually going to crop off screen slightly. And then um, create animation state data for it. Pretty straightforward stuff. Animation state we're going to use for like tracking animation. You could use it for mixing, etc. later on, but we're not going to touch that for now. Uh, here's an animation state listener. I've got it commented out. We'll come back to that in a second. And then here's the process of rendering our code out. Um, so basically, we, we update the state so the animation knows uh, how much time has elapsed so that it can update itself. Uh, we apply the changes to the skeleton. Uh, we, we update the world transform. I'm not sure if that's required or not, to be honest. Uh, and then our GL stuff. We basically set up a camera, update the camera, uh, set the projection mode, which probably only needs to be done once, actually. Uh, start our sprite batch renderer, and then within our drawing calls, we just call renderer.draw, and we pass in the skeleton object, and it takes care of the rest. And really, that's about it. That's all that's really involved here. And let's see if we've made any errors. So go ahead and run that, and boom, there is your animation playing in game. Now the cool thing is there's a lot of more things you can do in code here. If you had a shoot and an, like you could run multiple animations at once. You could have, you know, the upper torso being animated to do uh, a shooting motion while your bottom is doing a walk. And you could run those at the same time, or you can mix between or blend together multiple animations. So there's a ton more that we're not touching on because we simply don't have the time to do this. Uh, but there is some pretty powerful stuff. And remember that event we wired up? Well, that's what this here does. Let me just uncomment that code. And this is just going to wait for the event to get fired. Check for the half event, which I believe is what I called it. Let me just make sure I actually called it half. Yep, half. Uh, and then if it is, if the string value is, I think I actually called it halfway. All right, let's switch that to match. So at the halfway point, we're going to trigger this, and all we're going to do is write out to the console. It's nothing really special there. Uh, we'll go ahead and run that code. And then, boom, you see that code triggered halfway through. And then what we saw here is we had actually fired off a different animation after. Then we fire our idle animation when we were done here. Now, because the otherwise here, what we said here is basically, for this animation, this third parameter basically says loop. So if I take all the rest of this code and got rid of it again, You'll just see our animation looping forever. Or you'll notice that I went one too far with my, oh, one, one too short. Ta -da. So you'll see it goes and loops. So the animation plays through again and again and again. Well, what we could do here, what we were doing here, is basically saying firing off the complete event as well. This is not something that we created. This is an event that's going to be fired automatically that we're listening to uh, on our track event here. So our so when we set this animation state listener, it's automatically going to fire a start event and a complete event. And then there's an end event, and the end event is not what you think it is. It's basically when it's being uh, wound down and disposed of. So you're generally not going to use that. But as you can see, we can just easily, when this animation ends, we can just fire off a different animation. The other thing you see here is this zero. And that's because I'm running them all on the same track. But you can actually have multiple tracks of animation running concurrently. Okay, so that is about all I'm going to cover today. Uh, I probably butchered over a little bit of it, trying to be quick and simple. Uh, again, I also don't know my way around this tool as much as I'd like to, so my workflow there of bringing the images in twice is flawed. There's no doubt a nicer, cleaner way of doing it than I did it there, and I mungled around a little bit here on the dope sheet, but that's all just you know experiences with the tool itself. You should have, I hope, a very good idea of what spine brings to the table, at least the basics of it. And again, we never got into some of the more advanced topics like um, freeform mef def mef mesh deformations, etc. Uh, this is all stuff just in the standard edition. But you see, you can easily create kind of complex animations. Very simple. And then the other thing we can do in code is we can actually add in um, slots and bones. And so we can have uh, interchangeable guns and um, you can have it automatically, you know, um, drop a gun on a certain animation, etc. So you can you can do quite a bit of really powerful stuff here. And the runtime is doing all the magic and the loading for you. Uh, there's a pretty impressive API behind the scenes. I've linked to it also uh, in the uh, corresponding article. So if you want more details, that's definitely available. So there is an API available for all these particular runtimes. So when you bring your code into your engine of code choice, 
Spine is providing you quite a bit of functionality there for uh, mixing and binding and recreating and controlling all states of your animation. Uh, so it's a cool, a very powerful tool. I, I hope you found that uh, informative and interesting. Uh, coincidentally, there are a couple of other tools on the market that are very similar to Spine. There's a product called Spriter and there's a product called Creature. In time, I will probably actually take a look at both as well. And if there's something specific you want to see covered in the future, please let me know in the comments down below. Also, please let me know what you think of Spine. Uh, do you use it? Are you already a customer? Is there something I missed that I really should have shared with somebody else? Uh, but this is a cool program for 2D artists who can save a ton of work, a ton of time. So if you're doing 2D animation, definitely consider checking out Spine. It's a cool project. All right, that's it for now. See you later.